No, it's not working. Okie dokie, that's no problem. I you run it from your end. Do you want yes. me to say when to move um, slide on? Yes, yeah. Hopefully you can see that. Yep. Excellent. Okay, if you can, next slide. <clears throat> so um, this seems quite a simple slide, but actually it's been a source of considerable debate because um, for many years, uh, a lot of people, including myself and Jeremy, thought that she was called Emma Louise Turner um, because it wasn't very clear. We didn't have a birth certificate. Um, the L was often rather enigmatic, um, so she used to sign herself Emma L. Turner or E. L. Turner. But anyway, we did find some documentation. She is, in fact, Emma Louisa Turner. And even her birth date for many years was thought to be 1866. Um, as in fact, we've now worked out that she was born at the very beginning of 1867. So right in the heart of um, the Victorian era. And she was very much a product of the Victorian age. Um, in, in many ways. She came from a, a very comfortable middle-class background. Um, if you can have the next slide, please, Danielle. And you can see her here in a photograph which only really came to light a, a couple of years ago. Um, uh, I'll talk a little bit later on about how material on Emma Turner for a long, long time was really just restricted to her published books. We didn't really have very much original material, and that's only come up as a result of the research that Jeremy and I have been doing. But you can see her here in the family home um, at Langton Green, which is just outside Tunbridge Wells on the East Grinstead side. Um, very comfortable middle-class family. Um, her father was a, a grocer and haberdasher. They had a, a, a rather fancy store in Langton Green, which was very um, clearly patronized by the good and the great. Um, and so they were well off, um, although not so well off that the sons of the family didn't have to work. Um, Emma Turner never worked, um, apart from giving lectures, um, and clearly was not necessarily in need of an occupation. Um, and you can see from that photograph that this was a, a comfortable family home. She was the youngest um, child of four, um, two brothers and a sister. Um, and she, it seems, had a very, very close relationship with all of them and with both her parents. This was a very happy and comfortable family. Um, and what seems to have happened is at some point um, she had health concerns and she was advised by um, a doctor that she needed to do rather more outdoor activities. Um, and it, it may well have been that she had tuberculosis or something like that. Um, if we can have the next slide. Um, so she started doing things like horse riding. Um, this is another photograph which um, only came to light last year. Um, from the Reverend Bird archive, which I'll talk about later on. So she started um, doing horse riding and walking and taking an interest in, in the outdoors. And um, it's around this time, probably about 1900, um, that she became interested in photography. And not in portrait photography um, or still life photography, which was the traditional route that lady photographers would have been encouraged to go down. She was more interested in outdoor photography um, and not just in landscapes, but actually in the natural world, although she had absolutely no uh, background in, in natural history or ornithology, there was no evidence of any of her family having much interest in this. So this was really something that she decided upon herself. Uh, next slide, please. And she, in circumstances which are still not very clear, she um, ended up going to Norfolk in either 1901 or 1902. She contradicts herself on this, but it was in one of those two years. And she met Richard Kirton, um, probably through um, the Reverend Bird, who I've mentioned already, and I'll, I'll come to him later. Now, um, I'm sure some of you would have heard of the Kirtons, um, Richard and his brother Cherry. They were really pioneering photographers, bird photographers taking the, almost the very first photographs of birds, um, both at the nest and not at the nest, um, alongside figures like Oliver Pike um, and, and, and others who were busy rushing at the time to really um, 
establish bird photography as a, a, a credible activity and also to make money from it. And the Kertons were great publicists um, and they were very, very impressive. And you can see here Cherry Kitten abseiling down um, a rock face to try and photograph, I think it was a peregrine's nest up in the north of England. And they, they published several books um, full of their photographs and they were busy um, touring the country. Um, um, giving lectures and showing their photographs. So it seems to be from a chance encounter with Richard Kerton that Emma Turner became very, very interested in bird photography. And he doubtless advised her on which cameras to buy and how to go about it. Uh, next slide, please. Oh dear, mine appears to have frozen. Bear with me. <laughs> oh, no, no. Right. So um, Emma Turner's in Norfolk. Um, she is at Hickling which is where she appears to have met um, Richard Curtin. And so she decided that this was to be the place where she would base herself and start, taking, uh, start being much more focused and concentrated in, in taking pictures of birds. So she decided that, you know, she was also obviously was a woman to do things by half. So she decided that she would build a houseboat um, and I say build, I mean, she, she didn't physically put it together herself, but she certainly designed it. And you can tell from this picture that she was, really had no experience of building very much. Um, but she designed and had built a houseboat, which she named the Water Rail, um, after the first bird that she had ever photographed. Um, what happened though was the, the Water Rail was built at Sutton Stave um, and then launched. But when they got to Ludden Bridge, they found it was too wide to go through the arch of the bridge. So they had to drag it out and then it was taken to Hickling by road on a trolley and you can see the trolley there. And this photograph, there's a whole series of these and um, we only discovered these about five years ago in, a, in the Reverend Bird archive. Um, and Emma Turner had written about this whole episode of, of the, the boat being too, the houseboat being too wide to get through the bridge, but we had no idea really of how it looked and suddenly we found this whole sequence. Um, and the next slide please. <clears throat> Goodness, this is <laughs> freezing quite badly. Ooh, dear. Yeah. There we go. Right, now here you can see it listing badly. Um, and on the left there, there's a rather majestic looking woman in a big hat. And next to her, uh, uh, he is also quite majestic, but he, he wasn't as tall as his enormous wife. And that's the Reverend Bird and his wife Kate. And they were to become great friends of Emma Turner. And Emma writes um, about this whole episode and how it took several hours with lots of men dragging this thing and horses leading it and the birds and she stopped halfway along for sandwiches and wine because the whole thing sort of went on all day. But eventually they got to Hickling and it was launched and it became an absolutely central part of her life um, in, in Hickling. And she spent um, most of the spring and summer there for several years and came back um, to Hickling regularly for about the next 20 years or so, um, sometimes spending winter um, times there as well, but usually in the spring and summer, which was the best time for the photography of, um, of uh, birds at the nest. And it was the photography of breeding birds that she really excelled at. Uh, next one, please. Now, this is the scenario that she created for herself at what has now become known as Miss Turner's Island, and is still known as Miss Turner's Island. And this is where I was taken by uh, Maurice Millard, who was the, the boat volunteer at, at the NWT, who was the one who was also interested in her. And the island doesn't really look anything like that anymore. Um, it's covered in scrub. I'll, I'll show you a picture later on of how it now looks. But in Turner's day, she had the houseboat there on the right, and on the left was a hut which served as both um, overflow accommodation for people that wanted to come and stay, because people did want to come and stay, despite the rather Spartan conditions. Um, and she also used that as a dark room. She used to develop some of her photographs in that, that hut there. Um, and there was also, we think, another smaller building uh, at some point, but we don't really have any... any um, visual record of that. But this was her island, this is where she based herself. And herself, of course, she was absolutely perfectly placed to um, be able to go out on expedition. She became very proficient at various waterborne craft. I mean, she had a dinghy and a canoe, um, and, and, and she became very, very skilled at navigating and propelling herself around the broads. 
um, although she was greatly assisted by the Marshman, and she's very gracious in her, her book, Broadland Birds, which is one of her big three blockbuster books that were published by Country Life in the 1920s. Broadland Birds in 1924 was the first of the three big ones. And she is very generous in that book in um, the praise and thanks she gives to um, the marsh men, as she calls them. And these were um, the people who made their living from the marshes. There were gamekeepers and reed cutters, some farmers, um, fisher, fishermen. Um, and she relied very, very heavily both on their local knowledge and expertise, but also on their assistance when she was lugging about all her very heavy camera gear. Um, which, as you can imagine, was quite an undertaking. I mean, when she was operating glass plates and uh, big heavy cameras, tripods, um, and the Marshmen assisted her in, in fabulously amusing ways. Um, she used to lie down on a punt. They would cover her in vegetation, old reeds and sedges. Um, she would have her lens poking out at the front, and they would just launch her um, into the reedy bays around Hickling Broad um, towards great crested reed nests and water rails and, and whatnot. And she would be there for hours, um, buried under this rotting vegetation. It's an extraordinary thing for um, anyone to be doing, let alone um, a, a rather, as we think, prim and proper um, Edwardian lady. Uh, next one, please. So here's an aerial view of Hickling. Um, and those of you that know the reserve will um, recognize, well, bottom right hand side is Whitesley Lodge in that bay. Um, and then the two uh, water areas are Swim Coots and Rush Hill Scrape. And if you, the bigger one is Rush Hill Scrape. And if you go sort of straight up from there, there's a sort of um, peninsula sticking out right into the center of the board. Well, that is where Miss Turner's Island is. And that's where her houseboat was moored for most of the time. Sometimes she would take it away um, to um, Hickling Stave, where the Pleasure Boat Inn now is, and, and in fact was in her day. She talks about that pub in correspondence. Um, and she would take it over there in the winter, because I think life actually out board to the island in the winter was a bit too rigorous, even for Emma Turner. But that was where she was, that was her base. And from there she explored the broad, photographing um, no manner of um, rare, secretive and unusual birds, um, most of which had never been photographed before at the nest. Uh, next one, please, Daniel. So here she is in, in a clearly very staged photograph. This appears in Broadland Birds. And, and I just love this photograph. I, I love the caption more than anything else. I mean, Alfred Nudd awaits his turn of the stereoscope. And there she is in a fantastic hat, um, and sitting in a boat, um, peering through a stereoscope, which was a, um, a sort of antiquated version of creating a 3D image. You'd slide the photographs in um, and slide the, um, the frame up and down to give a sort of 3D image. I mean, it, it, it's not very impressive to modern eyes, but at the time it was probably quite revolutionary. And Alfred Nudd was really her main man. Um, he was a gamekeeper, um, hugely familiar with the wildlife and the birds of the broads. Um, and of course, this was a time of very, very heavy gamekeeping pressure on birds and all wildlife, actually, um, other than hares, rabbits, pheasants and partridges. Um, and I'm doing another project at the moment about the Reverend Bird and um, Alfred Nudd was a very close friend of his too. And the butchery that went on is rather changed my mind about Alfred Nudd because um, I think he did sort of reinvent himself later in life um, as somebody who was um, very keen and supportive of conserving some sorts of birds. But certainly in these days, he was out there busy robbing uh, Montague's Harriers' nests of their eggs for London collectors. Um, and one of the most shocking things was how um, he used to, and he wasn't alone in this, he would shoot the male Montague's Harrier um, once all the eggs had been laid to reduce um, the possibility of rival egg collectors um, seeing that there was a pair around and looking for the nest. So um, quite a, a brutal and rather different world, certainly, from the one that we inhabit now. And it's one that Emma Turner worked to change. Um, she um, could see the pressure that these birds were under. At Hickling later on, there was a, a very good level of protection under Jim Vincent, um, the actual gamekeeper of the Whitesley estate. But it was a very mixed pattern then. Um, next one, please, Daniel. 
So probably this is the most famous photograph ever taken by Emma Turner. And this came about in 1911 when um, she took a series of photographs of a young bittern, um, only sort of recently out of its nest, and thereby proved that the bittern had returned to Britain as a breeding bird after extinction for 30, 40 years um, at least. And um, bitterns had been seen around Hickling uh, during the summer um, of the year before, and then they were seen again during 1911. So with Jim Vincent, she set out to try and find the nest, and they literally launched themselves into a reed bed. This was actually at Sutton Broad. Um, they launched themselves into a reed bed and walked in ever decreasing circles to try and find the nest. And there, finally, in the middle of the, the reed bed, they found this young bittern. But alas, it was too late in the day to take photographs. It was uh, getting dark. So they did something which by modern standards would be unthinkable and also probably unnecessary, but um, it, it is quite an amusing story. They scooped the bittern up in a jacket, um, carted it off, stored it overnight, um, and then took it back the following morning at dawn, plumped it back in the reed bed, more or less where they'd found it, and photographed it then. And this is the, these are the results. This is um, the photograph as it appeared in Broadland Birds. And the next slide will show us the full picture, which is this one, which is one of the original glass plates, which we discovered at the BTO in an old battered cardboard box last year. Um, and you can see this is actually an even more beautiful photograph in, in its entirety than how it was reproduced in Broad and Birds because you get a sense, sense of perspective and, and the, the lovely slightly out of focus view at the back which um, is rather wonderful. So um, great um, acclaim. By this time um, Emma Turner had already published her first book about marsh birds. Her photographs were attracting a lot of attention. She'd, um, she was exhibiting at the Royal Photographic Society, where she eventually was awarded a medal for her photographs of birds. Um, she was becoming a really important person. And she wasn't important just because of the quality of the photographs and, and the rarity of the birds that she was photographing. She was important because she became a very, very proficient um, a recorder of the detail of bird behavior. She wasn't a, a, a sort of the Edwardian equivalent of a point and press and move on. She spent hours looking at these birds, understanding their ways. And she wrote a whole series of papers on bird behavior for, for the journal British Birds. Um, so she really was um, intruding in a major way into what was an overwhelmingly male world, a very sort of masculine world where women were not really expected to do this sort of thing. Um, and she gained admission to that world because she was very good at what she did. Um, and I think it's um, testament really to her um, observational skills, but also the fact that she just went about her business um, and did it very well, very proficiently, um, didn't expect any special favors from anybody, but um, the results of her photography delivered the reputation that she rightly gained during this time. Uh, next one, please. So I mentioned Jim Vincent and here he is. Um, I looked at this picture earlier on and I thought, my God, his hands are very peculiar. But then I realized that actually those are not his hands dangling down. They are actually the feet of baby bitterns. He's holding two or three bitterns in his hands. Um, he was the head gamekeeper at the Whitesley Estate, which is where Emma Turner took almost all of her major photographs. And he really did become a huge force for conservation. He um, very carefully protected the rare birds of prey that, that nested there, which is remarkable given that, of course, traditionally they were all shot because they would harass the wildfowl, which was the whole point of, um, of having um, a gamekeeper at the Whitesley Estate. It was um, run by, or owned and run by a syndicate and was very famous for its, its um, wildfowling and for its coot shoots. But Jim Vincent became a really, really um, important force for conservation and protected um, particularly the harriers and the bitterns and the bearded tits and all the other birds which in the 1900s and, and up until the First World War really were very much the quarry of, of both specimen collectors or, or you know people who wanted mounted specimens in glass cases in their posh homes and egg collectors and Jim Vincent really pushed back against this he would set his men up to guard the Montague's harriers nest Montagues were a common well not common regular breeding species there often up to six or seven pairs in some years Marsh Harrier is much rarer then, um, because it's gone the other way around now. Um, but um, 
I like to think that, that Jim, Vincent and Emma Turner, because they were good friends, would have sat down together and talked about the conservation of, of birds and how it was important that we not only protect the birds, of course, but also their habitat. And Jim Vincent did a lot to create the optimal habitat at Hickling for birds like Pitten. Uh, next one, please. Now, um, Emma Turner really excelled at photographing birds that were notoriously difficult to get close to. And, um, one such bird was the snipe. Um, you can see in that picture here, she, there's a little baby snipe just peering over the back of the, the mother bird. Um, and the caption says a little bit about um, Emma Turner's approach. I mean, she, she wasn't sentimental, but she read sort of human qualities into, um, into birds. You know, the, the, the mother snipe is proud. Um, and the chick is looking at the world. Well, yes, perhaps. Um, but um, she wrote very um, amusingly, really, about um, an episode where she was covered in um, reeds and sedge, and the birds were kind of walking around on top of her. She was actually photographing um, a reeve on its nest, which was a very rare event. And I'll just read you a little bit about what happened next. Um, she says, in 1907, when I was hidden beneath a heap of reeds, photo reeds photographing the reeve, a snipe frequently settled on my shoulder and expressed his emotions in the usual creaking manner. As he was close to my ear, the effect was thrilling. For some seconds before the actual sound escaped, a wheezing noise like the whir of machinery went on inside the bird. Then suddenly the harsh sound was emitted and simply shouted all unconsciously into my ears. Once or twice, I felt the slender bill gently prodding my cheek all over, and once it was thrust into my ear. So she was really up close and personal with these birds um, in a way that actually no other photographer really had been, not even the Kirtons. They, I, I said earlier about the Edwardian equivalent to point and press and move on. The Kirtons were a bit like that, um, but Emma Turner definitely was not. I mean, Richard Kirton would, would never have written a paper on the behavior of the water rail for, for British birds, for example, which is exactly what Emma Turner did. Next one, please. So grasshopper warbler, another bird, well, it's impossible to see even not at the nest, um, but she managed to, to capture uh, decent photographs of, of those as well. Um, quite remarkable, really. Um, and this particular photograph was um, the product of days, if not weeks, of preparation, sitting, waiting carefully, trying to find a nest that was um, able to be photographed without disturbing the birds. Uh, next one. And here's the water rail, really one of her favourite birds. Um, and as I said, one that she wrote about um, extensively in papers, um, and she took endless sequences of, of photographs of, of rails at the nest. Um, and it really was a, a bird that I think had a very special place in her heart. Next one. Now here we have Maurice Bird. Um, I mentioned him earlier. He was the vicar of Brunstead, or Brunstead, it, it goes by both names, um, on the edge of the broads. And, and one of these amazing um, sort of Victorian um, polymaths. I mean, he was interested in virtually everything, archaeology, um, meteorology, astrology, ornithology. Um, he was um, absolutely extraordinary in terms of the record making that he um, undertook. And he's actually my current project. I'm writing a biography of him for his family, who are the custodians of the most remarkable archive. I think it's the one of the, well, certainly the best natural history archive um, in Norfolk, possibly in much wider than that, because he kept a very detailed natural history diary for 50 years from 1874 until his death in 1924. And he also, from his diaries, compiled an extraordinary almanac of cross-referencing. So you can go to the almanac, look up, say, Pied Flycatcher, and he has entered in there the entries in his diaries that have records of Pied Flycatcher. It's absolutely extraordinary. Um, his family are very acutely aware of the importance of it, and they take good care of it. Um, it's currently in my office um, here because I'm researching the book, but um, it will eventually have to go somewhere um, very suitable for, for it to be looked after and hopefully digitized and made more widely available. At the moment, it's all just the original material as compiled by the Reverend Bird. 
So he used to go out um, yonking around um, in, the, in the broads with, with Emma Turner. And one of the most remarkable things was uh, when I did an article for Turn, the NWT newsletter a few years ago, um, the great granddaughter of the Reverend Bird saw it and got in touch with me and said, actually, we've got a whole load of Emma Turner material here. And they have 50 letters from Emma Turner to the Reverend Bird. We had no, we had no letters written by Emma Turner. Um, there's a small archive of her diaries that have come down through her family, but we, we had no correspondence, obviously, from her because it had gone to other people. So to come, to come into um, sort of knowledge of, of 50 pieces of correspondence about what she was doing and where she was going was absolutely amazing. Um, and that's really one of the most satisfying parts of this whole Emma Turner jigsaw that's come together in the last few years. Uh, next one, please. Now, the Reverend Bird um, used to go out with Emma and both she and he write about roughs at Hickling. And this is a photograph that we found in the Reverend Bird archive in a box. Um, and I'm almost certain that this would have been taken by Emma Turner. You can just make out three roughs, three male roughs with their white roughs in the foreground. Um, so again, a picture that she never published in any of her books, but I'm pretty certain that this is by her because she writes about going out with the Reverend Bird um, looking for the displaying roughs. And this was kind of almost an annual event at Hickling that small numbers of roughs would come and would, would lek uh, temporarily. And in one year, in 1907, as I mentioned, um, they actually nested. Uh, next one, please. And there is the rough on the nest taken by Emma Turner in 1907. Hugely exciting event. And the bird was very closely protected, although there is some evidence that that was all in vain. Um, and we've never quite unpicked really what happened, but it seems that an egg collector did get there, took the Reeves' nest as eggs, but replaced her eggs with red shank eggs. So she carried on sitting and Emma Turner carried on photographing, we think. We're not quite sure. It's a bit unclear exactly what happened. But anyway, it was a, a bit of a landmark event because they were um, effectively extinct by then, of course, as regular breeding birds. Uh, next one, please. The other um, exciting discovery in the Reverend Bird archive were photographs of ground nesting long-eared owls. Now, um, Emma Turner talks about these um, in Broadland Birds, but for reasons which are not very clear, this fabulous photograph and several like it were not reproduced there. So this was the first time anybody had seen this since the 1920s, I guess. Um, and it seems the owls, which of course are normally tree nesters, um, were nesting on the ground because the trees that they usually nested in fell down. And so they just took to nesting among brambles and undergrowth um, on the ground. And Emma Turner took a whole series of amazing photographs of them and writes very um, powerfully about um, them in, in Broad and Birds. Uh, next one. And here are some young long-eared owls. And you can see here how there are three of them, and they're all different ages, which of course is quite often the case with baby owls. And, um, and Emma Turner talks about that and how she felt sorry for the smaller one, which I guess is the one in the middle, because she could see how the other two would just bruise their way to the front and take the prey that the parents were bringing in. But a beautifully composed photograph that actually, um, whether by happenstance or design is not clear, um, but a very good example of the very accomplished um, images that she was producing. Uh, next one. So by now, it, we're kind of in the 1920s, um, she is, Emma Turner is very well established among the natural history community. Um, she's rubbing shoulders with the good and the great. And, and this photograph again is one that popped up that nobody really knew about. And in the canoe there is Arthur Patterson, the great uh, naturalist of, of Yarmouth, um, who appears also to have been a good friend with her. And with him in the canoe there is Roland Green. And if we go to the next slide, um, you can see him there. He was an artist based at Hickling. And those of you that have been inside Whitesley Lodge would have seen his amazing murals that he was commissioned to do um, in 1930, I think. Um, and this photograph must have been taken um, shortly before they were installed. I think it perhaps is even the installation day because the, the murals, of the canvases have been brought outside to be photographed. Emma Turner standing there in, in the middle in her trademark grubby gabardine. Uh, and next to her on her left is Bernard Riviere, who, of course, some of you will know is the great Norfolk ornithologist and the, uh, the author of Birds of Norfolk. I'm not quite sure who the others are, but doubtless luminaries of their time. Uh, next one, please. This is the only photograph 
we actually have of Emma Turner in action. Um, we've got other photographs of portrait shots of her, and of course the one I showed earlier of her with Nudd, but that's a staged photograph. This is her up a ladder, um, peering at what might be a long-eared owl nest, actually. She, she writes in a diary about photographing long-eared owls nesting in an old crow's nest, I think, and so that might be that. It's not the greatest photograph, but it's all we've got of Emma Turner at work. Uh, next, please. Now, um, during the war, um, by now she's well established as a, an important ornithologist and photographer. Um, and she goes to um, stay um, up on, in Holy Island in Northumberland at Lindisfarne Castle, which was owned by uh, the owner of Country Life. And this might have been how she managed to get her book, her later books published um, by Country Life. But at the time she was writing a book that was never published called Birds of Norfolk. And there's a lot of correspondence between her and the Reverend Bird and also to Jim Vincent about this Birds of Norfolk that she was compiling, but it never saw the light of day. And we've never found out why she stopped working on it or where the manuscript had gone. Um, that she obviously was working on because um, her diaries, which are very spasmodic, she appears to have destroyed some years and torn pages out of others. Um, but the, di the diaries for um, 1914 winter, 1915, well, most of that year, are very detailed and she's spending most of the time at Lindisfarne Castle writing Birds of Norfolk. So we're not quite sure what happened. But by 1916, she was back um, down in Kent where the family home was and she was working as a volunteer cook as part of the war effort. And this is an unusual picture, I mean, because she's obviously working as a cook, um, but she's also looking straight at the camera. And we only have three or four um, photographs like that. And again, this was one that, that, that popped up rather unexpectedly. Um, so we're very pleased to, to have this. Uh, next slide, please. Um, here she is again. Um, now, by, uh, the, the reason why we think this is 1920 is by um, 1918, she's living um, in a, a Girton um, near Cambridge and she's becoming, become quite friendly with sort of blue stocking characters in Cambridge. Um, and you can see that in her dress here. Um, she looks decidedly more with it and cool then than she did earlier on. I mean, she looks almost younger there than she did 10, 20 years before. So I think she was having an interesting and perhaps more exciting period of her life socially. Um, and this photograph, we don't really quite know where, um, where it was taken. It may very well have been on her island. You can see the reeds in the background on the left there. Um, and we know that the red set of dog um, was um, procured for her by the Reverend Bird, because that's in a letter that, um, she wrote to him. So we, we've got some bits of the background to this, but I, I think this photograph probably maybe a bit earlier than 1920, but um, it shows a rather different side to the, to the Emma Turner that, that, that we thought that we knew. Uh, next one, please. Now, here she is a few years later where she's gone back into old lady mode. Uh, this is a photograph of her that appears in her book, Bird Watching on Skull Head. And there are two big Norfolk chapters in Emma Turner's life. The first chapter is Hickling and her time photographing birds and the house boat. The next chapter is what she got up to on Skulk Head. And um, Skulk Head was home to some very important turneries and, and colonies of other breeding birds as well, like oyster catcher and, and ringed plover. Um, and these were regularly being raided uh, both by local people um, who would steal the eggs either to eat or to sell to eat and by egg collectors and, and, and it was carnage and chaos. And so the Norfolk and Orange Naturalist Society decided to do something about it and they advertised for a turn watcher. This was towards the end of 1923, um, a turn watcher for the 1924 season. And nobody volunteered. And I think this was happening at the Society AGM in, in towards the end of 1923. And they asked volunteers and there was silence. And all the men were sort of shuffling, looking at their feet and not really wanting to take part. And so Emma Turner stood up and said, well, if none of you will do it, I will do it. And that's basically is what happened. I mean, she was in her 50s by now, but off she went to live on remote Sculpt Head. And she did it for two seasons, the summer of 24 and 25. Um, and during her time there, um, the turn colonies prospered beyond all measure. I mean, there were several times the number of, 
birds nesting successfully at the end of her second season there as when she took over. Um, it was a strange life. She lived in the little hut, which we're going to have a look at in a minute, but the Fleet Street media got wind of this and they dubbed her the loneliest woman in England and, and reporters tried to visit her and she got absolutely livid about this because she said she, she was never lonely. Um, she, was, she was never on her own actually because people were visiting all the time, both friends and also other bird watchers. Um, but it was quite interesting that her first foray into the mainstream media was because of this sort of Robinson Crusoe type perception they had of her life on, on Scott Head. Uh, next one, please. Now this is a, a bit of a grainy image. It's an Inona Turner original, but that is the hut that was built for her by the, by the society, actually. It's now a grade two listed building. Um, this picture is taken from the dunes above it, looking across to Brancaster. Um, and if you go to the next slide, <clears throat> there it is. Um, fabulous grade two listed building, architect designed, um, erected for the watcher. Um, they didn't know that at that time it was going to be Emma Turner. And this is where she lived for two summers, 1924 and 25. It was quite Spartan inside. Um, she had a flagpole erected. In fact, if you, can you go back, Danielle, to the slide before? Because I think, and oh no, maybe not, I think the flagpole's behind the chimney stack there. It's not there anymore. Um, so if we go back to the contemporary view. Um, she had a flagpole there and she, um, basically the deal was that um, if she, um, needed assistance, she would run um, a tea towel or a flag up to the top of the flagpole um, and then people would come from the mainland and that's where all her supplies had to come from. I mean they were brought over every few days and um, it was a very tough and spartan existence. She caused a major emergency once by um, doing some washing and running it up the flagpole to dry it and then forgetting that that was the signal for rescue. And so a whole load of, of guys from Brancaster State came storming across the marshes to find that she was actually perfectly well, um, but for which she felt rather guilty. Um, next one, please. Now, this is the hut inside. Um, and um, Tom Balderston, the, the warden for Sculpt, um, it's run by Natural England. It's owned by the National Trust, but uh, looked after and managed by Natural England. And Tom Balderston very kindly gave me permission a couple of years ago to go there with Emma Turner's two great nieces. And that's Joan Keeling on the left and Julia Volrith on the right. Um, Joan sadly died a couple of years ago. She actually met Emma Turner. She used to go and stay with her as a girl. Um, Emma Turner was her, um, Joan's father's sister. So she was Aunt Emma. And Julia Volrath, um, she's a different branch of the family. She never met Emma Turner, but she remembers her father talking about Emma Turner. So these were very, very valuable links for Jeremy and I when we were tracing the history of, of Emma and her biography. Um, but the inside of the hut is actually really very similar to, I think, how it must have been in Emma Turner's day. And still the little wooden bunks, which are off to the right there, which she used to sleep in. So it's an incredibly atmospheric and it was wonderful to go and see it. Uh, next one, please. So while on Sculpt, she did a lot of photography, photographed terns, uh, oyster catchers, and ringed plovers, red shanks, um, and also undertook a lot of uh, birding for migrants, um, regularly tramping around um, the, the low scrub there. Um, she had her dogs with her. She was a very doggy person, always had Manchester Terriers, um, and usually more than, than one or two. Um, so it was a rather singular and interesting life. Um, she did it for two seasons and then a permanent uh, warden was found and, and she went off to do other things. But a rather remarkable time in her life um, and an important milestone in the conservation of birds on the North Norfolk coast for sure. Uh, next one, please. Now there were of course some birds that are perfectly familiar to us um, as being quite common in Norfolk but which for Emma Turner were um, extinct species for which she had to go overseas. And this is a photograph she took of um, an avocet um, in Holland. She went to Holland a couple of times, first in 1920, so that was before the, the Scott Head um, part of her life. But um, she was very excited to see birds like avocet. And next one, please. Uh, Black-tailed godwit, also then uh, extinct as a regular breeding bird in, in England. Um, and the next one, please. Uh, black tern, still extinct as a breeding species in the UK, of course, but then uh, nesting uh, relatively commonly in parts of Holland. So these were all very exciting birds for her to connect with. Um, and she went to the island of Tessel, 
um, and cycled around there um, like a maiden aunt on her um, sit up and beg bicycle, stopping every so often to uh, photograph birds. And she writes about that visit in um, Australia's from Nature's Notebook, which is the, the third of her big blockbuster country life books. Uh, next one, please. Now, by this time, she was um, very busy as a lecturer. And you probably can't see this too clearly, but this is a flyer that she made to publicize her lecturing services. And she probably learned this from the Kiertons, who, as I mentioned earlier, are sort of masters of publicity, self-publicity. And she had various little booklets and flyers like this made. And she became very, very popular as a lecturer. I mean, obviously, her images were second to none. And she would play to packed houses. I mean, there's a record of her giving a talk in Cambridge. Um, where the hall was packed to the gunnels and they had to do a, re a repeat, a second sitting, two days later to a house of sort of 80 people. So she was very, very popular. She used to use the lectures as opportunities to um, make the case for conservation. She was very distressed about the um, uncontrolled building of bungalows along the coastline, um, about the attitude of people to, um, to wildlife generally, the wanton destruction of certain types of birds and what she saw as the cruelty uh, uh, that people demonstrated towards birds. And she realized actually the way of changing these attitudes was through education. She was very, very interested in promoting um, uh, a, a sort of awareness of nature conservation among younger people. And she had some very influential friends. She was great friends with the Duchess of Bedford. She once visited the Duchess um, in, in Scotland and was um, cruising around um, the Orkneys um, and Northern Scotland in the Duchess of Bedford's yacht, the Sapphire. Um, so she had very influential friends. And I think she used those contacts to try and encourage a change in the mindset of people to conservation. And um, you know, this was very, very important because we're still in the kind of 1920s and 30s here. And, she, uh, I mean, for myself, living in the Brex and uh, chairman of the Brexton Society, I was thrilled to read one of her lectures where she makes a very strong case for the Brex becoming a national park, which would be fabulous. It's a dream that we still think about from, from time to time and hope one day it may yet happen. But she was really ahead of the game in this um, but, and spent a lot of her time traveling around lecturing. Um, as I say, she never seemed to um, have no money at all, and she can't really have been paid very much for these lectures. She would have been getting royalties from her book uh, um, and, uh, and uh, her, her books when she produced you know, more than the, the initial board of birds. But I think there was some family money there. But um, anyway, she, she was very busy on the lecture circuit. Uh, next one, please. So Emma Turner um, and her island today, well, this is it. Um, this is what it looks like now. And um, there are the two great nieces. Um, we got permission from the NWT to actually land on the island. Um, this isn't normally allowed, but um, special permission because of, of the, um, the nieces and, and the fact that they had both been there before as, as girls. Um, and it's now full of scrub and brambles. I mean, we really have to fight our way on. In Emma Turner's day, um, it was extensively lawn. I mean, the picture right at the beginning, I showed you where she had the hut where, which was over for accommodation. And, um, and where she developed her pictures. That was all on a very nice lawn that she writes about keeping uh, well maintained. Now it's all thick scrub and, um, and there are sallows, willows, and, and also an apple tree, which I rather like to think is a result of her having tossed away an apple core at some point. Um, but it's a great place to go. And if you go on the uh, NWT organized boat trips, they will take you out and you can go right next to it and around the corner. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, Countryfile did a piece on Emma Turner, uh, which I was involved in. And uh, it was the most freezing cold day. It was May, when, as you know, um, the weather can either be 25 degrees in Norfolk or it can be five. And it was five. And it was so cold. And I was huddled together with John Craven trying to avoid hypothermia breaking out. Um, and we eventually staggered off onto the island. And I remember John Craven just looked so unimpressed. I don't think he quite understood the, the magnitude of the occasion because it was so bitterly cold. But what was wonderful was, even though it was only five degrees, reeling away just beyond that little tree you can see above Jane Keeling's head was a grasshopper wall, which was rather wonderful because that would have been a bird that Emma Turner would have heard on her island all the time, I should think. Uh, next one, please. So finally, let's have a little canter through some of the birds that, um, that Emma Turner would have been very familiar with, but now are gone. 
And one is red-backed shrike, uh, a lovely male bird here. Um, in Emma Turner's day, this was a common hedgerow bird. It appears in her correspondence, it appears in the Reverend Bird's diaries. I mean, he doesn't even say very much about it because there were so many. I mean, he sometimes says things, saw first red-backed shrike today, and then says, saw four male red-backed shrikes on my walk from X to Y. I mean, you know, the, a totally sort of different situation compared to now where we get excited if we see them on passage in the spring and the autumn. Uh, and the next slide is a photograph that Emma Turner took of a, a male shrike at the nest. Uh, that was taken near Hickling. Uh, next one, please. Now, Montague Harriers, um, common enough in her day, and Jim Vincent writes, um, I think in a letter, or maybe it was in his diary, that um, at the end of a good nesting season at Hickling, when all the pairs had had young, and all the young had fledged and were flying, he could see up to 30 Montague's Harriers in one sweep of his binoculars over the, the, the marshes at Hickling. Quite remarkable now, and um, I'm not sure, I think, I'm sure Dawn will know this, but I have a feeling that there are no confirmed records of nesting Montague's Harrier this year anywhere in the UK, which is very depressing. Um, but in her day, um, a perfectly regular sight and a bird that everybody would expect to see um, and did their best in latter years to, to protect and make sure that they nested successfully. Uh, next one. Here is a photograph that Emma Turner took of Montague's Harriers in the nest. Um, and um, certainly um, the nests were well protected, as I mentioned by Jim Vincent, but, but this was not, not the rare bird that it is now. Um, next one, please. Corn bunting, another bird that was very common in Emma Turner's day, now very hard to see really in Norfolk, apart from in one or two favoured locations. And the next slide shows a photograph that she took. This is um, from Broadland Birds. Um, and um, corn bunting on the left. And I love the caption on the right of a yellow hammer. So the yellow bunting has his suspicion aroused. Um, I wonder what by, but um, yeah, again, I this would have been a regular sight for her, but not, not so anymore, of course. Uh, next slide. Some birds, of course, are still there and are there in better numbers than in Emma Turner's day. And this is a fabulous shot of a bittern by um, Liz Dack, who um, some of you will know, and is a wonderful photographer who also works at Hickling. Um, many more bitterns now around than they were in Emma Turner's day. Um, so that's, uh, that's a, a wonderful thing. Um, and I think, I mean, she would be greatly heartened that it's still possible for people to go to Hickling and not only to, to see bitterns, but to hear more than one or two booming. I mean, you know, it really is a bird that has, whose fortunes have completely changed, uh, thanks to very good habitat management and, and reduced persecution. Uh, next one, please. Uh, grasshopper warblers are still there, as I mentioned, we, we heard one during the country file shoot. Um, still a bird that you can hear at Hickling. Uh, next one. And marsh harriers are much more common than they were in Emma Turner's day. They, these were the rarer of the two breeding harriers, only ever one or two pairs a year nesting in the broads back in Emma Turner's day, and sometimes none. Um, so again, she would be hugely heartened, I'm sure, that, that these birds are now um, are now more common and doing very well, not just in East Anglia, of course, but across the country. Uh, next one. And there are some birds, of course, that Emma Turner would never have heard about, um, and certainly would never have seen because they weren't known in the country then. Chetty's Warbler, um, illustrated here, which of course, you know, you can hear singing in almost every month of the year. I heard one yesterday, despite the inclement weather. Um, and a common bird now, um, unknown to Emma, of course. Uh, next one. And cranes, um, you know, she would have been excited beyond all measure to have seen or heard cranes back then. And now one of the reasons why people go to Hickling. Um, and if you play your cards right, of course, you know, you spend a few hours at Hickling, you're almost certainly going to hear, uh, hear or see them. Wonderful. Uh, next one. And little egrets, another great Liz Black photo here. Um, again, a bird which, well, I can remember, I'm sure you can all remember when these were very unusual and we got very excited and now we don't give them a second glance. I mean, they proliferated beyond all measure. Uh, but for Emma Turner, this would be one of the hugely exotic birds that she would only have seen uh, by traveling uh, to Southern Europe. Um, next one. So um, finally, let's just wind up with a little bit about the end of her life and about her achievements. Um, 
she came to a bit of a sad end. Um, she, during the 1930s, she had to stop lecturing because her eyesight was failing. Um, she was persuaded to have a cataract operation to try and correct it, and that was bungled, it went badly wrong. And she was left basically blind as a result of that, which is a cruel fate for uh, somebody who had used her sight and her camera to record such fabulous images. So um, the lecturing stopped. She still remained very active in the Cambridge Bird Club, um, and she would get the younger members of the club because she was still so enthusiastic about um, educating young people in, in, in positive attitudes to, to wildlife and conservation. And she would get them to come to her house. She was now living in central Cambridge and they would come to her house and read to her from the latest journals. Um, and then she, she died in 1940. Um, and really what happens next is still a bit of a mystery. She left all her photographic material to the BTO in her will, but it, it, it's never resurfaced. What we found um, at the BTO you know, last year or year before is nothing like the full archive, so we don't know where that's gone. Um, she also, um, there were records that she, she gave slides also to the RSPB, but they're not in their archive either. So I still hold out hope that more material will, will turn up. But in terms of, of her legacy, um, she's a hugely important person. First woman to ever get a medal from the RPS. She was among the first group of women to become honorary members of the Linnaean Society and the BOU. Um, and she took the first ever known photographs of a whole array of, of scarce and rare birds. Um, thereby setting new standards in bird photography for others to, to follow. But also, she left us a fabulous written record through her books of a world which we only really now can imagine how it was. Um, a Norfolk Broads teeming with birds, much quieter in some ways than it, it is now. Although, of course, very much a working landscape with the marsh men who were so useful and helpful to her in her, her photographic work very much living on the land at the time. So I commend her to you um, and hope that that's um, giving you an insight into, I think I've probably overrun, um, but I'm very happy to take any questions if anybody has anything to ask. Thanks very much. Thank you, James, that was absolutely fantastic. I'm sure I'm not the only one that found it very inspiring. Um, if we just have a quick look at the chat and see if there's any questions on there. Um, Dawn has said that one breeding record has come to light for 2020. Oh, yay. Excellent. Well, that's good. Is, is Dawn able to tell us where that was? Not really, James, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's, in, uh, it's um, Eastern England. Okay. Oh, well, that's good. That's yeah. good. Yeah. Mm. The third of her books um, is, actually I should have it in front of me, it's called Stray Leaves from Nature's Notebook. It was published in 1929 and it's a collection of sort of essays really, different episodes of her life. She writes a little bit about, um, about her trip to Holland for example um, and also about trips in the Brex I think and also the Heathland down near the Kent Sussex border where she grew up, where she used to go and listen to night jars. I mean it's quite interesting her books but when I first started researching her which is over 10 years ago these three books the three country life books were readily available in second-hand bookshops for not very much money you could pick them up for a fiver or a tenner um, now the only one that you find relatively easily is Broadland Birds that probably had a bigger print run um, but the Skull Head book and the Stray Leaves for Nature's Notebook they are harder to find and they now seem to cost about 30 pounds um, so if you ever see them um, and they're not up at that level by them because um, they are running out and they were never reprinted because what happened during the war, of course, the cost of paper went up um, and it just became prohibitively expensive to publish books and to reprint them. And we found some letters to her from Country Life, from the publisher, um, obviously responding to her saying, well, look, can you reprint, saying that, no, we don't have any plans to reprint, I'm afraid, we, we just can't afford to do it. So they're quite a scarce commodity now. Um, thank you, thank you for the nice things you're saying. Um, yeah, I mean, her books are really interesting, not just for the photographs, but because of the wonderful descriptions that she makes of um, the process of photographing the birds, how she used to go about doing it, how she got close to them, and things like the snipe walking around on her head and stuff. 
um, but also their behavior. And you can tell from the level of detail that she gives that, that you know, this is the product of, of hours, days, weeks of observation. I mean, it's a lesson to us all, it's an instant gratification age that we live in now. And in the age of twitchers, you know, who storm up, um, you know, twitch the bird and then run off again. Um, she would have hated that, Emma Turner would have hated people like that. Because, I mean, she felt that the slowly, slowly, gently way was the best way to connect with the birds and to learn about their lives and what they did. So. Any more or are we there? Well, thank you very much for tuning in. Um, and thanks, Danielle, for um, doing this. So I don't know quite why it was freezing, both for, well, chronically for me and, and <laughs> fortunately less so for you. It's obviously the really high res images that you, <laughs> that you I put think in. So, yeah, that's probably, probably <laughs> what they did. But anyway, it worked, which was good. I did just have one question, if that's okay. Sure. Um, I just wanted to say that obviously she's an incredibly inspiring figure um, and fantastic to hear about. And I, I guess my question is, what do you think we can learn from Emma about young naturalists starting out and, and, and what kind of tips can they take from her? Yeah, there are, well, there are various things there. I mean, firstly, and this isn't really for the very young ones, this is for the older ones. I mean, she didn't get involved in photography of birds till she was in her thirties. I mean, it was a, an alien world really for her. And only by chance, you know, having met Richard Curtin, that she got involved. Um, and yet she, she got up to speed so fast. I, you know, it's remarkable really. I mean, you know, her first foray in the broads was in 1901, 1902. By 1907, she was publishing her first book, um, The Home Life of Marsh Birds, which was co-authored with, with a guy called Barr, um, full of amazing photographs. So she was, you know, really fast tracking herself. Um, and so I think that there's a moral there that, you know, it's never too late to do this stuff. Um, but the other point is the one that I've perhaps already made is that you have to put in the time and the hours. Um, and it was this meticulous observation that got her the amazing pictures, but also this huge bank of knowledge. Um, and it's so interesting that people like Patterson and Riviere and the great ornithologists of the day were all trooping to her door. Um, because they respected her as somebody who really knew her stuff. Um, and I think also um, she never gave up persuading and encouraging people to become interested in wildlife and, and its conservation. Um, and that, that is something that's, that I think, very commendable. I mean, one point which I should have made, um, there's so much you can say about her, but, but one question which people often ask and haven't on this occasion, so I will ask it. <laughs> Which is, what was Emma Turner's view about women getting the vote? Because here she was, a woman in a very um, masculine world, at a time when the suffragettes were actually moving to quite violent means and were um, throwing bricks through ministers' windows, cabinet ministers' windows, and blowing up post boxes and things. And it would have been very interesting to know what her view was on this. She must have had a view. But at no point have I ever seen anything where she's said anything about it. It's most peculiar. One imagines that she probably would have been in favour because um, she was great friends with the Duchess of Bedford, who of course was a great advocate for the emancipation of women. Um, but it is a bit peculiar. Um, and the other question, which perhaps you're all being too coy to ask, is was there ever a man in her life or anyone in her life and the answer to that question is no, <laughs> there doesn't appear to have been. Um, she once in a letter to the Reverend Bird um, talks about a guy who was preparing a book on birds and had asked to meet her, possibly um, to use some of her photographs in his book. And she meets him in London and she writes to the Reverend Bird about it. And she says as a kind of throwaway comment, blah, 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 he's a, he seems a very nice gentleman, um, but he's married. And then in brackets, she says, but they all are the men I like. And that's the only clue that we have to um, any affairs of the heart for her. Um, she, she dedicated a lot of her life to looking after her father and the children of her sister who predeceased her. So she was very committed. I mean, hers was the life of an Edwardian spinster aunt, I think we can say that. And so the photography was a way of breaking out of that, I think. Um, 
and, and she did that very successfully. I think Dawn has a question here. So does she say much about the scarcer birds she found on Skolk? Yeah, she, well, yes and no. Um, she says a lot about the um, sort of lack of birds that they found. They used to go out during the autumn, particularly September, October time. They used to go out, they, say they, it's her and her dogs, tramping through all that Sreda bush, you know, on, on Scott Head, trying to find rare migrants and actually not finding very many. Um, she talks about finding a blue throat, I think, but the photograph in her Scott Head book of the blue throat is not hers, it's one that she brought in, so she obviously didn't photograph it. Um, she actually talks most excitedly about the winter birds that came and also about an extraordinary invasion, well, invasion, influx, every early winter of hooded crows, which of course were a common wintering bird at that time. And she talks about them streaming in off the sea and coming over, over Skolt Head. Um, but no, there's not very much about really rare birds. I mean, there, there's stuff about birds that are common for her. Hooded crow is rare for us now, of course. But um, no, she wasn't hugely successful in finding great rarities there. Oh, she saw a black stork there once um, when she was showing around, I think, the Duke of Leicester. So she was very pleased that, that the black stork showed up when she had important guests. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, it's, um, they're all good reads. Um, they really are. And, and it, it's a world that's lost to us now. Um, although Scott Head's still a fabulous place to visit. Any more for any more? Okay, right. Well, thank you all very much. And thanks, Danielle, for, for hosting and supervising. Oh, thank you ever so much for joining us. I think it's been an absolutely fantastic talk and I'm glad we have this recorded for those that were unable to join us as well. Great. Thank you, James. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Danielle. Bye-bye. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye.